Hi, my name is Maria Andrea. Welcome to Books and Bocadillos. I am here with a chai latte, and I want to have a chat about my recent reads, current reads, so kind of like a reading update slash check-in. Let's get chatting. Cheers. I have to drink the tea because it's going to get cold. <laughs> um, so I want to start off with books that I'm currently reading, then transition to recent books that I've read that I want to talk about, and end with another um, poetry side dish like I did last video. So books I am currently reading. I want to start off with Beowulf. By It's a new translation by Maria Davana Headley. I actually am really enjoying this. Um, I didn't get to it in October as I had hoped. So I started it just like last weekend. Um, I'm in the introduction. So um, this is one of my 41 books to read what you, for the Read What You Own Challenge. Um, I'm taking my time with it because it's like a tiny book. It's, it's a novella. But um, I'm in the introduction. I've been in the introduction, and this is why. Because I'm, I don't know if you can see, I'm annotating. Um, this book is absolutely, the introduction is fascinating. So if you love talking about translation, you love um, language, um, linguistics, the history of words, the way language changes over time, interpretation of language. You'll just love the intro like I am. And I'm like, she's like talking about in her introduction, she's talking about every like um, theme and character. Um, it is fascinating. I cannot stress this enough. Like it's gonna take me a while to finish this book just because it's so fascinating and interesting. I'm just so compelled to take notes and I love this little bookmark pen. I got this in the month of October at um, a charity event and it is so neat. It's a pen and a bookmark. So it goes right here and it's actually really, really good. I'm really happy with it. Um, I am gonna love this book. This is a book that I anticipate will be five stars. <sighs> I can't wait. <laughs> it's just gonna take me a while. I just, it's, and it's the kind of book that I carry around in my pouch um, and just have on hand. Like I started this, I took my mom to a doctor's appointment and just pulled this out and read while we were in the waiting room. Um, yeah, it's that kind of book that I just wanna take with me everywhere I go and any like break that I have, just read it. Just the introduction and you guys, it's like, I'm already having this feeling for it. Like I, I love it. I read Beowulf in um, high school, so I'm really excited to get into it again. So I'll put it over here. Then um, I wanna talk about this one because I talked about it last time. So The Hurting Kind by Ada Limon. This doesn't have the cover jacket because I got it um, I got a discount on it. They had it at the Barnes and Noble, like this is like a year ago or so. Um, and the the jacket was torn. Um, so I just took off the jacket and I just have the, the naked hardback. Um, and I picked this up. I've been just keeping it on my desk and in the mornings, just maybe like read a random poem. Last time I shared with you, um, privacy. Um, I have another poetry collection to draw from today, but it's it's a book I'm keeping on my desk and just reading. Um, Crow Planet. This is uh, my number one pick for nonfiction November. If I read anything for nonfiction November, I want it to be this book. Um, I'm I just started it like this last week, so I'm still in the beginning like. I read the introduction, actually it's called um, An Invocation, Kros and Kairos. And then there's like a note on names and pronouns. So I'm just starting, I'm like a page away from just starting chapter one, getting up 
a reluctant crow watcher. I am loving this as well. Um, it is it is so cool just to read about crows. So a funny thing I was sharing with my husband, a funny like fact or like study that crows actually can have the ability to recognize faces, um, which I always wondered, but I didn't know for certain. And so there's a study that they did and uh, I'll share brief, just briefly with you. It says to taste to test the idea that crows were recognizing faces in such instances, rather than clothes, gait, or other some other identifying characteristic. Marsluff employed masks. A dangerous caveman mask was donned by students who trapped and banded seven campus crows. In the following months, volunteers wearing the caveman mask walked prescribed routes known to be frequented by these crows and their associates. The birds went wild reading the Crow Riot Act whenever the mask wearers passed. For control purposes, the same volunteers walked their roots wearing a Dick Cheney mask, which had not been worn by the trappers and banders, and the crows left them entirely alone. It appears that crows also learned to dislike individual humans through social learning, if birds in a given group appear to loathe a particular person, other crows in the group will take up this aversion for themselves, uttering a vocal rebuke when the person is spotted or avoiding him entirely. And then it goes on. But I thought that was so cool um, because I recently had that encounter with the crow just like watching me through the window. And I thought that was like so cool because it was like as if it wanted to talk. Um, and it says that everybody has a, a crow story to tell. So crows are just naturally social and we all have interactions with crows that are fascinating and interesting and we want to talk about it. So anyway, I'm really excited to continue learning more about crow behavior and what that means for our ecosystem. So Crow Planet, it is Essential Wisdom from the Urban Wilderness by Leanda Lynn Hout. Okay, this way. Um, I have this book here. This is a book that I've been avoiding because of sensitivity issues that like triggers for me. But just this year, I kind of felt like, okay, I think I'm ready to, to go there. So I picked this up. Um, what God is Honored Here, Writings on Miscarriage and Infant Loss by and for Native Women and Women of Color by Shannon Gibney and Kyle Kalia Yang, editors. So this is a collection of um, essays by women of, um, like Indigenous women or um, women of color and they all talk about their experiences with miscarriage and infant loss. So I'm like reading an essay at a time. Next is this book here. So book is Can We Talk About Something More Pleasant by Ross Chast, a memoir. Um, this is a National Book Award finalist and National Book Critics Circle Award winner. And this book is on my list of a thousand books to read before you die. It is a graphic, kind of like a graphic novel, very much in the style of like Relish, if you are familiar with that book. Um, I think Ross Chast is a, a cartoonist and um, artist and it's her story about having com difficult conversations with her parents, particularly around death and dying and end of life. Um, I'm not very far in. I had to take a break from it. I started it this morning and I had to take a break from it when I got to 9-11. So um, they're reflecting on when 9-11 happened and I was like, okay, I think I need to pause here. But um, so far, so good. So far, it's a good read and I'm really excited to finish it to see... Um, what what makes it like one of the 1,000 books to read before you die? So can't we talk about something more pleasant by Ross Chast? 
um, okay, I'm running out of space. I'm like, don't want this tower to topple. And the last book I want to talk about that I've been reading is um, this Playlist for the Apocalypse by Rita Duff. This is a collection of poetry. Rita Duff is a Pulitzer Prize winner. And um, this is has a sticker for the 1,000 Notable Books of 2021 by the New York Times Book Review. I heard of this book on the book, Bookworm podcast um, by KCRW. Back, uh, I was in an episode with Michael Silverblatt um, and his interview with Rita Dove. And I love the interview so much. I ordered the book back then and maybe like, then was this came out in 2021 so this is from 20 i purchased this book in 2021 and it had it on my shelves and i've been picking it up and just take like kind of like the get a limon book just taking a poem here and there um so those are the books that i'm currently in the middle of currently dabbling in i'm a dabbler so i read a little bit here and there um recent reads i want to talk about so my favorite book from my cozy ween tbr was this one this is beowulf and it is a graphic novel the oh, it's so cute it's so cute um this takes place around Halloween and um, the kids band together and they're collecting candy and um, they are it's based on like the story of Beowulf, but it's like told for kids. So um, they they're facing attack um, by by the monster and um, it's written so beautifully. Um, I wanna read a piece of like the, so the author writes like just the author's note in the back. Mm. Let me see. See, like the author break, breaks down how the sounds and the rhyming in the writing, because it is, it does be like a poem, like an like an epic poem, like Beowulf. And he talks about how that you know how that concept came through. Okay, so let me see. So I'm going to read just the last part of the last part, the last paragraph in his author's note. At one point late in the original Beowulf poem, a dragon grows angry because man steals from his golden hoard. Beowulf is part of the golden hoard of our language. Tolkien stole from it for his story, and you should too. You might summon up a dragon of your own. Zach Wienersmith, Wienersmith Manor, Spring 2022. Um... Yeah, it's just beautiful. It's like the illustrations are by um, Boulet, a French cartoonist, animator, and illustrator living in Paris. Um, the artwork is like so adorable and cute and wonderful and beautiful. It's like amazing. Like it's so cute. <laughs> These kids are adorable. Yeah, so I don't know if you like if you like Beowulf, if you like children's stories, if you like epic poems, um, rhyming, uh, fantasy battles with monsters. I think you'll like this, and I highly recommend. It's it's gonna be a reread for sure. I think it might be one that I come back to every Halloween. Okay, so. I read Beowulf. I recently posted about this book 
The Yield by Tara June Winch. This is one of the books that I had for my um, Indigenous Lit Month TBR. And so I got it, picked it up, uh, read it, loved it, five stars, immediately want to reread it. So I just finished it on Friday and I'm penning to tap through because so now what I want to do is, okay, this book is written in three timelines. Yeah, three timelines. So there's the timeline of a minister, um, missionary that is sent over from England to Australia as part of colonization efforts and his letters to to the the people in in London about what they need um, in terms of funding, projects, support, um, what he's seeing on the floor, on the ground with um, the tribal like communities, and and so that's there's all those letters and that tell a story of a time, and then there's um, the grandfather. So there's this man and he, we know that he passed, but he has left behind a dictionary where he, um, he wrote a dictionary to preserve the language of his people um, and his community. So the dictionary is written very much as like, this is the word in our native language. This is the English, this is what it means. And then it's kind of like when you are learning new vocabulary, you're asked to use it in a sentence. So then he uses that phrase or that word to tell a story, like a memory or an anecdote. And so then there's the beautiful family history that is told through the words in this dictionary and the phrases in the dictionary. And then there's August. So August is the granddaughter. She comes to Australia for her grandfather's funeral and she finds that her community is in turmoil and they, the lands are being exploited. The people have been exploited and she and her family feel a call to action. And it's them coming into like their fighting spirit to take action, to help preserve um, their land, their community, their culture. Um, so it's these three different storylines and they all are intersecting to tell a story of a loss of language, a loss of culture, a loss of people. It is really, really good. I read it straight through, but these timelines are like, you know, like one after the other, like they're, they're stacked up all like together. So I want to then reread it and then so read all the ministers, all the missionaries like letters and then read all of the dictionary and then read all of August's activism life coming to fruition. So I am just really, really interested in like doing an immediate reread. Like I don't want to put this off on the shelf. I really want to go back and take another look at it. Um, but in like like chunks, like all of like, instead of like staggered, um, just read the different threads in the whole chunk. Um, so this one is going to continue um, <laughs> at this rate. I don't even know how long it's going to take me to read 41 books that are that, um, that I already own. Um, yeah, I don't know. But I'm not going to worry about it. Okay. Rebecca. Um, I, I, I don't know. I'm not thrilled about Rebecca. Um, I checked Rebecca out from the library. And I started, I got it on Kindle. It's so slow, so slow to get into it. I really struggled. I ended up then purchasing this like mass paperback, super cheap, um, because I needed to like try to get into it. And honestly, like having this didn't help. 
it's taking me forever. I started Rebecca in October and I still couldn't finish it. I really just wanted to finish it. And I thought about DNFing it so many times because it was slow build up. The language is beautiful. The writing is beautiful. The descriptions are wonderful. Like everything was so vivid and beautiful prose. Love that about it. But there's only so much that you can take of that without like having anything else because I wasn't liking any of the characters. I was starting to like not care. Like I don't really care to know what happened to her. Like I was just starting to feel very um, apathetic because I really didn't like anybody in the story. And I already kind of had a hunt. Like I'm like, oh, I bet this is what's going to happen. And I was right. I don't know. I felt predictable. Everybody was talking about a twist when I was trying to like get into it. I would listen to podcasts or um, try to read reviews and people would talk about twists, big twists that's like worth like protecting and not being spoiled. And so listen, you know, like if you haven't read, you might not want to listen because you don't want it to be spoiled because it's so great. And when the twist came, I was like, yeah, I mean, I saw it coming. So it really didn't feel like a big twist to me. It felt like, yeah, of course. <sighs> and then the ending, I was like, of course, like, I don't know. I wasn't shocked. I wasn't really intrigued. I felt dragged. I felt the way I felt when I read Flowers in the Attic. And I'm so sorry. I know Flowers in the Attic is a beloved book. I read it for Garb August. I didn't jive with it. Um, so I, I think I gave Flowers in the Attic two or three stars. I gave Rebecca three stars. Um, three stars only because the wonderful thing about a disappointing read is that if it makes you want to read more books or gives you new appreciation for books that have been inspired by this book or that it that kind of have similar themes then i think you know what there's something there so beautiful language did not like the pacing did not like the characters didn't find it compelling um but I um, did listen to a podcast called Novel Pairings, and they usually talk about classics and then give like pairings or like suggestions for books that complement well or that would be in conversation with this classic. So for Rebecca, um, there were three books that really like I felt really compelled to pick up like ASAP. And that's Gone Girl by Jillian Flynn, Starling House. Um, I can't remember who who the author is, but I'll put it in the description. So Starling House is just came out, I think recently. And um, the way they talked about it made me feel like, oh, yeah, I would like to read that. And they talked about The Hacienda, which is on my TBR, which is a book I started, haven't finished, want to get back to. But it just kind of made me feel like, okay, you know what, let's, let's get back into that book because maybe I'll like it better. And it is um, compared to Rebecca. So I do want to get through that. Um, it also made me really appreciate two books, Jane Eyre. Jane Eyre feels like a masterpiece, even more so. Jane Eyre has always felt like a masterpiece to me, but even more so in light of this book. And um, Mexican Gothic. I really liked Mexican Gothic, and I know that there's some Rebecca-esque inspiration to Mexican Gothic. I liked Mexican Gothic a lot more now um, than I did then. So when I first read it, I liked it, but I think now compared to this, I'm like, I would prefer Mexican Gothic over this. Um, I think there's, I mean, I know for its time, it's maybe it's, it's, good for its time maybe the audience that read it at the time maybe you know it felt differently but to me there were some queer elements there that just felt really like unexplored I mean Rebecca as a queer character I also kind of saw Frank as a possible queer character but I felt like they were closeted and they didn't 
like that. But I know that they had to have been closeted at the time. So maybe the modern reader would kind of, maybe me as a modern reader just sees that as like, mm. and I know that there's history with the author. There's like, you know, I did do some reading in the, in the back of the, of the Kindle version. I don't know if this one has it, probably not. The, in the back of the Kindle version, it talks about the author's life and history and how um, Daphne du Maurier was bisexual. And um, that wasn't something, I mean, that was something that she protected. So I don't know, I mean, I think probably was right, written right for its time, for the time period. I don't think it stands the test of time though. I think it feels like it's lacking in modern times just my opinion. I'm sorry. I know this is a very beloved book. I know people love this book. I really, really wanted to love it. So I feel really disappointed. But again, gave it a three because it did make me want to read other books with similar themes that maybe would elevate the conversations that it could possibly entertain. So that's that. And so I want to end with a um, poetry side dish. So something I read in um, in October was The Lottery by Shirley Jackson. I'd read it in high school or middle school, high school or middle school. And I wanted to reread it um, in October. So I picked it up and um, I was going through my, my poetry collections and where is the one I read a dove? Here it is, Playlist for the Apocalypse. I was going through this one and I found this poem and it reminded me of the lottery. So like I said, whenever a poem reminds me of a book I recently read or a book that I'm talking about, I do want to try to share it here in a video. So because I read the lottery in October, the lottery is a story that I've, you know, reread. I like it, I love it. It's And it's not my favorite Shirley Jackson, but I do think it's a haunting story every time. And I feel like it doesn't lose its sense of like, oh my goodness. Okay, so this is a very short poem. It's titled Little Town by Rita Dove in her collection, Playlist for the Apocalypse Poems, published in 2021. <sighs> Little Town. Cobble your streets and no whining. Stones are abundant here. Stones and weather and air. So that's it for me. Thank you so much for watching. And let me know if you've read any of the books I talked about, if you have um, other suggestions that maybe are good themes to pair with Rebecca that maybe would elevate the conversation or make me feel a little bit like give me a little bit more than what I received from reading Rebecca. And um, yeah, if you have anything to share, tell me what you're reading. Love to hear it all. Hasta la próxima.